thank you for joining our collegiate parent conversation about college admissions during um, an unusual season. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Amy Brown Lockard, who is a contributor to Collegiate Parent and an independent college counselor in Portland, Oregon. So Amy, we'd love to hear you tell us a little bit about yourself and your business, and then we'll dig into some of the questions we have about um, college admissions process right now for the incoming high school juniors and seniors. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Diane. So as Diane said, I'm Amy Rom Lockard. I own and operate Dovetail College Consulting, which is based in Portland, Oregon. I work with students nationwide, so it's a lot of fun for me. I've got kids all over the country, and I work with them to look at careers, majors, colleges, and other post-secondary options, and all of the pieces in between, from SAT and ACT to financial aid, requesting teacher recommendations, filling out applications of all kinds. So that is in a nutshell what I do. Wow, that's a lot. And I know you <laughs> have been super busy this spring as you helped last year's batch of students make their decisions during kind of a difficult time. Mm -hmm. But are all those kids taken care of? And Yeah, yeah. everyone is all set they know plan. where they're going yeah they yeah. they've known for a while um and there have certainly been some adjustments with regards to the pandemic you know student orientation events that might have been on campus over the spring or the summer were moved online things like that um, but everyone is set and excited to go and i'm so excited for them to dig in and get started that's great so they're taken care of, um, but I think a lot of high school students who are just starting this process with their families or those rising seniors who, for whom everything looks a lot different than they might have expected are wondering, um, have questions and are wondering what's the best way to approach, um, approach the process of applying to college right now. And I thought maybe we could start a little bit with those rising seniors and um, what's different about the application process for them this year um, in terms of everything really that you can speak to and, um, and also how do they account for the impact the pandemic has had on their, their lives and their education. Definitely. Well, I would say we would start at the conception of the college list because that can look really different for students. Some may need to stay closer to home. Perhaps they have a, a family member who is um, ill, whether and whether this is related to the pandemic or, or not, something different. Um, but proximity to home may be a new priority for families, especially because there is a lot of fear now and Parents would like their students to be a little bit closer to home in case of emergency. Mm -hmm. And financially, it may make more sense to have a student closer to home as well, whether that student is commuting from home and living at home and saving costs of room and board, or perhaps just saving money on airfare and travel to and from the college. Um, mm -hmm. And also maybe going to a public in-state university where the price tag is possibly less than going out of state or private. Um, and that can, that can depend on the school. Sometimes I've had students get wonderful financial packages at private schools where it costs less. But overall, I would say more students are looking closer to home right now or initially thought they were going to go further away and had these dreams of attending college in other parts of the country. And they've had to rethink that. Yeah, do you encourage them to sort of expand their list or do you to include a few more options um, or do are some of them just realigning their lists all together? Yeah, you know, every family has been a little bit different with how they prioritize distance of the college. Um, and so for those who would like to stay in state, we look at wonderful in-state options. If they're on the West Coast, we look at Western undergraduate exchange as well, mm -hmm. where students can attend other schools in the region for um, 
a cost that is similar to what they may pay at their in-state public. And so if, if finances took a hit with the pandemic, we might be looking at those schools, the WUI schools. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but gosh, every family has been really different. I've had some students that initially wanted to go further from home. Maybe they wanted to go across the country or out of country and they're sticking by that, the families are fine. And other students whose families have shifted and said, this isn't a, a viable option for yeah. us now. Yeah. So the lists have definitely changed. So the list, that's the starting point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the list is definitely the starting point. Yeah. And we're also thinking about testing, SAT and ACT, that has really shifted, as you know. Mm -hmm more colleges have pronounced they are test optional. Some are test blind, meaning that if families and students submit scores, the colleges won't even look at them. They're not a consideration. Wow. Yes, but you also still have some schools that are going to continue to require the SAT or the ACT, or at least that's the current plan. So, but with that said, some, some of these students weren't able to get a test in this spring, and I, I understand it, you know, there are going to be questions about fall, so possibly those schools might have to change too. Is it too soon to say? It's not too soon to say. Stu colleges have um, put out those decisions. It wasn't like there was just sort of a big influx of announcements of we're all test optional. It's, I feel like it's continuing to develop. Mm -hmm. and. I'm wondering if those colleges that have not yet gone test optional may feel some pressure mounting and will, you know, there's still a window for them to change their minds. It would be nice if they made their minds up a little bit earlier to yeah, spare right. the, the yeah. students the experience of testing. But for my students, I'm actually encouraging them to forge ahead with their testing plans mm -hmm. and to register for the fall, which will see a, a great increase in the number of test dates to accommodate mm -hmm. folks who couldn't test in the spring or the summer. But even though there are so many test optional schools, we don't necessarily know if there is a particular alumni scholarship that will still require scores, mm -hmm. an honors program that will still require scores, outside scholarships that will ask for them as well. Right, right. So just in terms of a safety net, if a student is able to take the test. I, I encourage all of my students to take it, just to have a set of scores so that they're not ineligible for something mm -hmm. else. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I hadn't really thought about the scholarship side of it, but I remember um, one of my son's friends who went to a flagship public university in another state, that was part of the formula that determined his merit aid. So that was a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. him. So um, interesting. Um, I, I, some there. There's also, of course, the 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 fact that students weren't really able or haven't been able to make those final visits to campus. Some students, you know, were not even the final visits. You know, initial visits maybe. And mm -hmm. I know that plenty of students, including my own son, a couple of years ago, apply to schools they haven't been able to visit in person. So, um, but that, that is often something that happens this summer before senior year and can't happen. So mm -hmm. I don't know if, you know, what you recommend students do to still sort of, the students who are still trying to figure out that best fit. And this could, this could apply to the incoming juniors also who were ready to get started looking. Absolutely. Spring break. And like you said, summer, those are really popular times to go visit colleges and so many of the campuses were closed to visitors. And so what I've really enjoyed seeing is the way that colleges have rallied to provide some type of an in-person experience as best they can. There have been, um, if you go onto any college's website and you go to the undergraduate admissions page, there are likely other options to visit. Mm. So it may be registering for an online visit and you have a student guide who's walking around campus with a selfie stick walking backwards, <laughs> trying to give you the experience. Um, there are still Q&A panels with admissions officers and, and info sessions. 
and there are websites like UVisit and Campus Real that give you a sort of a, a virtual tour, a virtual walking tour where you feel as though you are on the campus. You can click arrows, go different directions, mm -hmm. hear student perspectives. Those have been really, really cool. And now that colleges have established those, I don't think they're going to go anywhere. I mean, that's always been an equity issue. Who could actually get to campus and who mm -hmm. shouldn't? And though there are many colleges that are amenable to providing travel stipends for students if they reach out, not everyone does that. And so it's great that, I mean, we think about the, the pandemic and how so many students can't make it to campus, but there are so many students that were never going to make it to campus to begin with. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. seeing folks become much more interactive and college fairs as well. Those have been really fun. The online college fairs yeah. where different schools host panels um, and they're typically on strivescan.com. So if a family mm -hmm. goes to strivescan, you can look at um, panels that previously occurred and they're super, super fun. That's, you know, I hadn't even thought about college fairs and um, I imagine in the fall they'll have to stay uh, virtual like that, most likely. So interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure if reps are going to be able to get out and visit high schools yeah. across the country. They may be virtual Zooms like we're doing, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but we just don't know. And the cool thing about those college fairs is normally you would have shown up as a student, maybe with your your parent or guardian, and you would dialogue with the admissions rep and that would be it. Mm -hmm. Now in these StriveScan panels, they're getting more creative and because it's Zoom, you can connect with anybody. So they're pulling in this really awesome professor from the philosophy mm -hmm. department and these students who completed internships and want to tell you all about it. Wow. So, yeah, you're actually getting to engage with more people and get a richer sense of the academic and, and the social experience. That's neat. You know, I've been to college fairs with my kids, so you do <laughs> sort of stand there at the table and you have your minute or two. And yeah, yeah it's not super personal. But yeah. um, these are definitely really fun. Yeah. And um, I know that, you know, I, I also it was kind of a two part question. The, the, um, these incoming seniors who are going to be doing their applications. I wonder if you can speak a little to how the effects of the pandemic um, are going to change the application itself, mm -hmm. um, the common application and essays and, and how schools might um, weigh their application given the, the fact that there have been so many changes to people's lives. Right. So for the first part of that question, how may the applications change? The common application, the common application has included now an optional question with a 250 word limit about COVID-19. And it's for students who have been affected in a way that feels really significant and highly impactful. Mm -hmm. So for me, if I'm a high school student and the effect on me was that I had to stay indoors, but that, that situation is so similar and, and, and very common to other folks around the country. It's almost expected. Mm -hmm. I may not benefit from using that space to describe that, mm -hmm. but if I am a student who has dealt with hardship as a result of COVID, and that may mean um, that it was difficult to have accommodations for my learning differences, that my mental health suffered, my family is navigating financial challenges, health challenges. Um, you know, so many folks were, were let go and are on, a, on unemployment right now. So something that would to the student qualify as a significant hardship, there is space in that additional information section to answer this new question about COVID. Not every college requires the common application. Mm. And so some of them will add a, a quick supplemental question to their applications as well. It may be, how did you spend this time? Mm -hmm. It may be, you know, is there anything you'd like to share with us about the impact that COVID-19 has had on you and your family? Mm -hmm. So colleges want 
to know. Um, and I know that you saw that article from mm -hmm. the many, many college leaders who banded together to share a unified message to students and families that we care about you. you we recognize that you are a whole person and that you did not have access to the things you normally would this you know, second semester of your high school year. So we're not expecting all of the extracurriculars. We're expecting mm -hmm. that things will look a little bit different and that's okay. And so I really thought that was a beautiful, meaningful and timely message. Yeah, um, me as well. No, I was happy to see that. Um, mm -hmm. And, and you, you know, I had another question about sort of shifting the college search and application process during the pandemic. And you did sort of address that, you know, your list might look a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, you know, you spoke, you spoke to this um, a bit in that many students will consider the schools closer to home and in the state system, public system, maybe they hadn't been thinking of those before for a variety of reasons. Are there other institutions that, um, might seem more appealing in the current circumstances. And by that, I mean possibly schools that have more established um, online programs already as part of their um, brick and mortar campus. Or, you know, I wonder sometimes is this, um, is, would this be an appealing time to go to a small liberal arts college that, or consider a small college that potentially could really put a little bit of a bubble over its campus or try to. Yeah. And I just wonder what you hear or what you think about, about that. Gosh, I've heard every option under the rainbow <laughs> at this point. Um, yeah, to your point, online schools are much more attractive right now because they've been doing this for a while, most of them, and they've got the process of online learning completely locked down. And in addition, I think sometimes we, those of us who have not taken courses online might look at them and say, well, there's not the community. You don't get the different things that you might get in person. When in actuality, um, so many online colleges and universities have done a wonderful job of establishing a really safe and loving, welcoming community with, with different kind of cohorts and communities within for students. So hmm. I agree with you. That's definitely a very appealing option for folks right now. Additionally, community is a, a fantastic option. The, you know, to live from home and not have to pay room and board necessarily to go to your local community college and hmm. save money and maybe get your prerequisite courses out of the way. So courses that are not in your major, if unless they're going to transfer to your intended college. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you are required to take a math and a history and an English and you're not actually going to major in any of them, it's a great way to, to save money and community is looking way more appealing to students, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, yeah, I, I have our, my niece is making that choice, you know, uh, and I think she's, you know, it's going to work out great. And it wasn't really the right time for her to go to a school 3,000 miles away from home in Southern California. So, um, yeah. yeah. I know. it's, And, you know, on the part of the colleges, they're wondering who's coming to us and how is this going to work? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, speaking of other options that students may be looking at that are more appealing, gap years. Many students are saying, you know, now now's not the time that I want to consider heading off to college because I want what I've always pictured to be the mm -hmm. traditional four-year college experience. So for students who have already applied and been accepted, or for those who have not yet applied, they may be thinking about gap years and deferring their enrollment at a college. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, gap year programs are... are you know, going to be doing very well. <laughs> yeah, and I suppose many of them, I heard I heard someone, her son is mm -hmm. doing Knowles, what is that, National Outdoor Leadership School, and I mm -hmm. think because it's outdoors and maybe they can limit the, the groups and, and make it safe um, this coming mm -hmm. year, but uh, I'm sure there's a lot of interest in programs like that, and 
Mm. But the, yeah, hmm. interesting. Um, I, I was wondering if you, pandemic aside, I mean, the pandemic certainly is um, affecting a lot of things, but in addition to that, are there other admissions trends that you think it's important for students and families to be paying attention to um, this year? You know, the, again, these rising juniors and seniors who are either partway into their college search or just beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so many. I mean, <laughs> the weirdest way, this is now a, we have this time for colleges to kind of experiment with different practices and we're trying to figure out what's going to stick and what's not. So I would say the, the practice of online learning, you know, that I would look at the announcements that colleges have made about that switch to online learning and is that looking like, uh, are they going to extend their trial period? Is this something they're going to be doing for the next three or four years? Mm -hmm. Or are they saying that they're just doing it right now to accommodate? for students. I'd also think about financial aid and the fact that so many families now are going to the financial aid offices of the colleges that they were, you know, students were admitted into and appealing the initial offers because things mm. have changed, their, their circumstances have changed. And so whereas families in the past have been a little bit hesitant to ask for more money unless the case was extreme, now families are realizing that the financial aid offices are here to help. They're incredibly empathetic and they want to help you get your kid to college and ideally to their college. <laughs> and so um, I think we'll see a, a large increase in financial aid appeals. And so just looking at the price tag of colleges and knowing that that's not necessarily the bottom line is, you know, it's just a good practice. Mm -hmm. And Additionally, I was thinking, oh, demonstrated interest was the other one I wanted to mention <laughs> to you. Demonstrated interest is kind of a murky topic that we don't really like to talk about. <laughs> because some schools will say, and I, I'll explain further, but some schools say openly, we consider demonstrated interest. Some say we do not. Some are silent, and you never quite know what they're doing in the background. But demonstrated interest is essentially, if I'm a college what do I perceive your interest is in coming to me and matriculating at my school? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how might you have demonstrated that? Did you show up to a college fair and speak with me? Did you go on our virtual tour? Mm -hmm. um, did you email me and, and reach out? But also there are now these funny little ways of measuring it. And I'm not gonna say this is a common practice, but I'm wondering with the pandemic, if this may increase, because it's going to become difficult for colleges to predict who's coming. Mm -hmm. um, demonstrated interest can also be tracked electronically through, you know, did you open my email? Did you click the links? Mm -hmm. How long were you on the website? What pages did you look like? Are you following us on social media? Oh my goodness. Click the link in bio. Yeah. How long were you on the page for? Again, it's not, a widespread practice, but I am wondering if because colleges are going to have a really hard time knowing who's coming, how many, especially private schools, will we see an increase in demonstrated tracking of demonstrated interest, whether colleges are forthcoming about that or not? That's really interesting because yeah. I mean, in the past, there were some you know, issues around that, you know, demonstrated issue interest that was going to require mm -hmm. actually a visit to campus, which as you said, there is an equity, you know, issue there that a lot of students aren't able to make those visits. And, mm -hmm. and so those other ways of, of tracking it, that's interesting. And um, it, that seems important too, to, for the school, really, when you think about it, as in an era when students have been applying to more and more schools, and um, hmm, so that's yeah. worth, and, and is there, you were just saying, some schools will say in, on their admissions page what they, whether they consider it or not, but others don't reveal that, so. Yes, and they're not going to say necessarily 
we track demonstrated interest by checking to see if you open our emails and engage yeah. with our social media. You know, they may just say demonstrated interest may include X, Y, Z. And some schools will say, we do not track this. And for those who make that statement, they're, they're being forthcoming. They don't track yeah. it. But mm -hmm. there are many schools that just don't speak to it. And so I am. Um, and in some ways, though, if you say the lesson there is demonstrate interest, do those things, it's also a way for the student to gather information about the school, to be, you know, not just to pluck, decide they're going to put it on their list because they heard a friend talk about it or it's, yeah. you know, where it's, where it ranks on, you know, on a list somewhere. So right. um, yeah. hmm. it's important to not waste time and just apply to schools because it's easy to click a few buttons and do it because that's time that could be better spent on applications that mean more to you mm. on scholarships. Yeah. So, yeah. Agreed. And I, I tell my students, you know, I say it's a, it's an uncomfortable thing for me to share this practice of tracking demonstrated interest. I don't like it. it um, I can sympathize on the part of the colleges and how maybe it's important information for them to have. But at the end of the day, this is you gathering data. Mm. Don't you want to see what's going on on a campus? These emails, you know, colleges are taking time to put this together. Don't you want to see what's important enough to them that they're communicating it to you? Mm. So it is to your I totally agree. It's very good. And that's, and that's interesting. And speaking as a parent too, parents will be interested to see those emails that their student is getting, you know, at some point, maybe it's not till after your child applies, you might start getting emails from the institution too. I remember some mm -hmm. were terrific at communicating while we were in that sort of in between, you know, before the decision was made period. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think the way that the college communicates or the university, it does say a lot. It speaks to some of the things they care about and, um, you know, and the way they value and nurture those, you know, those prospective students and their families. So, Absolutely. Yeah. What are they, what are they highlighting? Um, you can get a good feel for the political nature of, of a campus and its student body by looking at its social media, hmm. you know, what, what it, does it choose to highlight? What does it value and, and put forward? And also, how did it respond to COVID-19? Because a lot of schools featured that on their mm -hmm. social media as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's very true. Um, I, my last question really was to pivot a little bit to earlier in high school to those um, rising juniors and mm -hmm. and um you know they still you know things it's, it's more than a year until they'll be applying but they're heading into what's usually this very big important year academically it's when you take tests it's when you start to put that list together or think about what kind of school would fit you best mm -hmm. and yet again their their lives are are really different right now. And I wonder if you have advice for those students and their parents. Mm -hmm. I think it could be really easy to approach the college search and this whole process from a, a place of fear and, and a place of almost COVID first. Mm -hmm. you know? And every family's circumstances are, are totally different. And so if you have experienced COVID and, and the, you know, had personal ramifications, I get that that could be your approach, but it doesn't need to be the blanket approach across. You know, by the time rising juniors are matriculating in college, the hope is that all of this will be behind us and there will be a new normal, whatever that looks like. So I would avoid Avoid the anxiety and know that there's, I mean, there's a lot of time between now and then for colleges to kind of level out. But in the meantime, they can just start exploring their own personal interests. There's so many mm. ways to do that, so many wonderful tools. Um, and just to get in touch with who they are, you know, when will we have this time again when, mm. you know, we're encouraged to stay inside encouraged to look at our own free time and figure out what to do with it. So, 
you know, it's as simple as what do you go down the rabbit hole with when you're on YouTube? You know, what, what gets your brain excited? And what are your abilities? And what's your personality like? What do you value? This is such a good time for self-exploration. And additionally, you know, referencing the message we were talking about before from the colleges when they all got together and put forth that statement of solidarity. The colleges are saying, we don't expect your extracurriculars to look like they used to. But now we've got this time you know, what may a student have wanted to explore? Like, you know, Diane, I decided I wanted to learn to play ukulele. Right, right. <laughs> I have students that are learning to do all kinds of things or practicing their skills. And I have students that are vocalists um, and, and are learning to juggle and mm -hmm. bake and do all, and read books that they've always wanted to read. Mm -hmm. um, students that are doing virtual volunteering, cataloging mm -hmm. items for museums virtually, yeah. um, looking at cells virtually and highlighting different, um, I think it was protozoa, he was telling me, a student was explaining <laughs> this to me. I mean, just so many cool things you can do at home to just explore yourself further. Mm -hmm. and course any any type of family circumstance that you're helping with or helping your neighbors you know if you are raking leaves taking out trash delivering groceries if you're caring for a loved one you're watching your siblings while your parents are out that's that's all an important meaningful way to spend your time mm -hmm. so those are the things I would be focusing on right now and it's kind of a rare opportunity to have that time so I would, I would, as much as students are able to sort of take a person first approach and to not be too put off by everything going on. Hmm. Yeah. That's great. Um, I don't know if you have any other last things you'd like to share about um, thinking about what, you know, finding that those colleges and universities that might fit you the best as a prospective student or you know, just really anything um, that you glean from your work with the kids you work with and, and your own knowledge of this industry? Definitely. I would say for every student, it's useful to have a must-have list, a list and a would-like-to-have list. Sometimes mm -hmm. a student will go on a college tour and they will say, wow, I saw the coolest rock wall in the fitness center and I really want a rock wall. Now, if you're a climber, I get that, or an aspiring climber, that makes perfect sense and that could be a must have. But if you're not, then maybe that shifts to the, you know, would be nice to have list. So mm -hmm. I encourage students to come up with a list of things where these are the things they need in a college classroom and culture in order to be happy and successful and really thriving. Is it small class sizes? Is it having, um, if it's a larger class, is it having breakout sessions where you can talk to your TA and understand the material? Is it a culture that is um, welcoming of LGBTQ plus folks and has really inclusive and welcoming policies and practices for students and faculty and staff? Mm -hmm. You know, really getting together a, a nice tight list of what do I need to be happy and successful? Mm. Because yeah, again, we can be really easily romanced by very cool, flashy features at schools. And to be fair, my partner is a climber and so he would love to have a climbing wall. And that would be, that honestly would be essential for him. I have students who want beautiful running trails, students who really, really love being near the water. And for them that is, um, it's going to be a big determinant for their their happiness where they go when they need to get away they go to the water they go to the city they go for a run mm -hmm. but yeah coming up with a nice tight list of maybe five you know five factors and not sacrificing that not finding a school that where we say well it doesn't have any of these things but i always wanted to go to school 
in this particular city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's important. And I, likewise, something I do that I, a lot of my students don't necessarily think of before we meet is to look at the course lists between different colleges. If I'm interested in comparative literature, I wanna, you know, I should be comparing the list of required and elective courses at this school versus mm -hmm. at this school. You know, really getting into the nitty gritty of what might I be taking and does this sound interesting to me? Um, does this school have way more requirements than this other school? Does this one have a cool study abroad option or a cool student club that relates or a, you know, an internship? So really digging into those course lists to differentiate between colleges is useful. That's interesting. And I don't think students necessarily think to do that, you know, yeah. maybe because they don't realize how different the um, academic offerings can be even between schools that might be about the same size, for example. So Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, definitely. It's really easy to go onto a college's website and search course catalog, mm -hmm. come right up. And lastly, net price calculators are phenomenal tools. And almost every college website I've ever visited has a net price calculator. You just need to go to the little spyglass in the corner, you know, to the search feature. But that will allow a student and their family, um, their parent or guardian, to input in information about, you know, finances from tax returns. Possibly the schools may ask for GPA, test scores, things like that. And it will pump out a rough estimate of what a student could expect to pay if they were accepted to that school and going. And it's not a financially binding number, but it can really help students differentiate between options. And you can have two schools that are a similar price and get two completely different financial aid estimates. It's amazing. Yeah, and that's because some schools are able to meet more of the demonstrated need or might have more merit aid that, they, that they're distributing. But um, that's, a, that's really a good point to make that the college has it on the website and then there are some others you can find like through the college board and, and there are a few others available. And that's also a good reminder of, and I would say my just to pitch in for those students, yeah. you know, getting ready to apply that uh, filling out the FAFSA, the uh, free application for federal student aid, which is available every fall after October 1st, is, is a rec prerequisite or requisite to being considered for financial aid mm -hmm. by the school. Even if you think you might not qualify, you very well might. And so, um, yeah. That's not too many months off, actually. I know. Um, I, goodness. <laughs> a student said to me yesterday that school is going to start for her in a month and a half. And I, it, right? It just blew my mind. Yeah. It, 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 I think we are in this funny place of time is passing and we know that it is, but it doesn't, you know, we have that Groundhog Day sensation at times that we're, we're not sure. But yeah, here we are. Um, in July. So yeah. it's been wonderful to talk to you. Same. And I yeah. so appreciate all the interesting information and things to think about. Um, and I think it'll be super helpful to our audience, Amy. And I always love seeing you and talking to you. So I know. thank Thanks you so there. much. I, I appreciate your time as well and, and such wonderful questions as usual. And, and I'm always happy to connect with you or anyone in the collegiate parent family to chat more about college, and college admissions. And, and just to let everyone know who hasn't read any of Amy's contributions to Collegiate Parent, um, on collegiateparent.com, we have a high school category at the top. Um, most of our content um, is written for the parents and family members of current um, college students, but actually the incoming students transitioning to college, we have a lot of information for them and when you click on high school you find Amy among other writers and you can see what she's written for us and hopefully there will be lots more coming from her including from this this talk today so thank you Amy and I hope you stay well and um, 
looks like the sun's shining in Portland and um, I look forward to our next conversation. Me too. Stay well. Awesome, Diane, and thank you. Thank you.